are you are you close to to securing any deals whether that be short-term deals that that, that are injury cover or, or longer-term deals no we're, we're not i'm not lying to you we we aren't it's it's proven to be more difficult than what i thought it would be even though the market is like i say um it's a buyer's market and I think that's I think that's the right way, you know. Like, it has to be the right choice for these lads. And just because we're out there and lo and looking, you know, we, we've gone through great lengths to make sure we've done our due diligence for them and for us, and it's the right decision moving forward. Just because there's good players in the market doesn't mean you should automatically sign them up in some kind of feeding frenzy. Uh, is there or, or was there an interest in, in Berger and that apparently might be off to Japan? Does that kind of fit into that category of there's an interest, but you also have to put in the bigger context of, of money that's available here compared to in, in, in other leagues? Yeah, look, we talked to him. He's a great, he's a good player, isn't he? He's a great player. And we talked to him because of one of those reasons I mentioned, because we are relatively light in the senses. Um, but again... Injury dispensation only stretches as far as the uh, the injured player's salary and, and or ability or both, I think. It's a combination of both. Um, so he didn't come into that, into the, into, he didn't enter or was as a, a comparable in either of those two categories. Well, on a, another note, Tom Roebuck was called up. Uh, to the England squad for, for for the autumn internationals. How delighted are you yeah. for him? And are you aware of whether Scotland were trying to or were interested in calling up? Because obviously he qualifies for both nations. Were, were you are you aware of whether Scotland were interested in, in trying to call him up to their squad? Yeah. Yes, I'm delighted. Really delighted, Kieran. And yes, I was aware. Um, why wouldn't Why wouldn't you be interested? He's he's been on great form and he's a good lad and he's got. Still, loads of potential to improve in his game. So, um, yeah, Gregor Townsend was giving him a call, and and obviously, and Eddie was and Eddie was watching him as well. Um, he was only born in Scotland, I guess. Like he, you know, in talking to me, of course he was interested because to play at the highest level is what every player's ambition is, isn't it? To to see where they're at on a world stage. Um, but he has little affiliation apart from uh, place of birth, unfortunately. So is he? Is he obviously he hasn't yet been capped yet? But is he committed therefore to, to England rather than playing Scotland? Uh, you'd have to ask him that yourself. Um, from my understanding, yes, he wants to play for England. Hence why he's in the squad. But um, well, there's no buts here. I mean, like. It, so, <laughs> I guess some of it will depend on his um, how invested, how much worth he feels in that environment. Um, with this taster that he has of it, and 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 where he sees his future being in terms of his his career ambitions as well. But that, them's you'll have to ask him. Granted, this is a, a couple of months away because George is it is still a few months away from being fully fit. What? It is the plan with Rob Dupree once George is fit. Is it to go back to 13 where he played quite a bit last season or with the way that he's played this season, is it is the plan actually now for him to challenge George for that starting tenure? I think that's the first plan, isn't it? Like George has to earn his his right and his way into the squad. You'd back George to, to be a pretty decent contender there, wouldn't you? Um, and then it's about getting the best back line and the combination of backs on the field and, you know, that's where we are now and where we'll be in two months' time. And it's probably completely somewhere different, Kieran, as, as, um, as what, you know, as professional sport, only professional sport, professional rugby, has proven in the past. So we'll come to that hurdle when we come to it. I think Rob's got the ability to play 10, 12, 13. We'll see. Cheers, Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Kieran. Alex, what do you think that uh, Tom's uh, point of difference is? is that when there's a lot of very good young wings around. Yeah. I mean, he was particularly good chasing the high ball uh, against Quinns, and he's probably one of your standard performers. But what is his point of difference? I'd say that um, is 
that's his X factor, that's his superpower, his ability to climb in the air, and I've said that a few times. But he's 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 adding um, a quality of finish, um, as well as is 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 definitely definitely his defensive abilities have improved over the last year. This is a big lad. If you've ever been up to uh, to Tom, he's like it's got to be six three, six four, and all of hundred and four kilograms. I'd say. Um, and he was a lad that perhaps in the past hadn't used his weight or his power to its best advantage, being as big as he is. We start to see that now in his carries and his defensive efforts over the course of the first five games. So not only can he climb, but he's a, he's a guy that can win collisions as well, both sides of the ball. But yeah, going back to your point, his point of difference is his aerial ability. But I think, it, I think it's right up there amongst some of the best wingers in the Prem now with his ability to win collisions. Did Gregor actually contact you at all just to get a, a low down on this? Yeah, they all do. Yeah, look, it's really humbling that, really nice. I mean, I don't get it for long. He's a bit overqualified for Scott and he was born there. <laughs> <laughs> They're yours, Chris, not mine. Did, did you, was it some time ago you, Gregor asked about him, or was it just this season? Because he, he burst onto the scene with six and six, didn't he? Um, yeah, the, 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 yeah, I don't know at what point he came onto their radar, but like with him and Reedy playing so well at the start of the season, we're like, surely they're watching him because they're both qualified for Scotland. And then, you know, when you start talking about it and the whispers start circulating, all of a sudden the phone goes, it's, so it's like, a, believe it and the universe will deliver it kind of thing, isn't it? For us anyway, it happened around the same time because of the form. Um, yeah, um, and and it's always obviously preceding when they call the the squads for selection. They're the training squads, and and they asked a few things about him. We had the forwards coach John come in, get his second name John, came in to speak to um, you and Ashman, and that was about three weeks ago. Lovely fella though, and we, and we shared we had some good sharing in terms of rugby. And on the back of that, he was asking about Tom as well, um, what kind of a bloke he is and stuff. And, so there's always there's always like constant communication with one or a few of the coaches from different national teams. So it's not unusual that you'll get contacted about uh, these young lads and, and where they're at and how they're getting on. Just finally for me, just something on a different tack. Uh, Pat Lamb was saying uh, that he he thinks that the remaining twelve rounds still haven't been sorted out after Christmas. Uh, probably won't be sorted out in, in, in a, a way that everybody would be happy about because it's too much self-interest. How yeah. concerned are you with the fact that we've got 12 rounds to be confirmed at this stage of the season when you're trying to plan ahead? Um, yeah, a little bit of concerned. Yeah, because I've already planned. <laughs> you already end up planning. And then these plans change, Chris. So, and like what I said to you, what I've learned most of all is to, is to be a little bit more flexible and with dislocated expectations. Um, around the curveballs that, that might appear. This is just another one of those curveballs. If it happens, we'll deal with it when it comes. But you can waste a lot of energy, a lot of hypothetical reasoning uh, around things that don't happen or could happen. So at the moment, it is as it is. And then if it changes, we'll flex and find a way. But the feedback you're, you're getting, I mean, are you going to these meetings or, or somebody else going? What's the feedback you're getting? Is it positive or is it uh, this could go on for some time? It, well, it can't, can it? Because at some point, things have to, um, hotels have to be booked, stadiums have to be prepped for and, and booked. So there has to be a cut-off date, I guess, or at least enough lead time to be able to, to make all those arrangements for a home and away games. The, they haven't changed anything till Christmas because it wasn't decided upon before Christmas. So everything, as I understand it, is is going to remain until at least the new year. And then maybe for the better of the game, there'll be something decided upon post-Christmas as to how everyone can at least see the benefit of working to a 12-team, a 11-team, 11 11-team 11 structure. Um, and eliminating some of those alternating bye weeks 
and have collected bye weeks. That was my understanding. Collected bye weeks within the Six Nations, so you get more games with your your, 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 your senior internationals, which should bring in more crowds and a, a, you know a better a better spectacle really out there for for, for the for the masses. So, just to clarify, you don't think it will be sorted out until the new year? I don't think no. It, from my understanding, there'll be no change in the fixes until the new year, if there are going to be any, because everyone's kind of booked in the Christmas and everything else. But it'll be too soon in the next three or four weeks to start making changes around the festive period. So what they're negotiating, from my understanding, is all those fixtures post the new year. Okay, great. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, Alex. Um, just to pick up on that, if, if they did have extra bio weeks during the, the Six Nations, how would you how would you fill that time? Would you would you organise more friendlies, or because otherwise there might be a big gap. Some clubs will have a huge gap at the at the end of the season if they don't do this. And so is it, is, is it going to be where everyone's off for a set period during the international? Yeah. Again, yeah, everyone's off for two weeks, and I guess if you are organised friendlies, it would depend on how many. I'm, 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 everyone's got, so the reckon players, the golden ratio of games is around 15 to 20, you know, to continue their development. Um, so if you're not playing at the weekends, a lot of your players go out to loan. You know, that's done everywhere now because there's no A, a Lee rugby. And we looked at organising a fixture um, against Leicester during this period because we've got quite a few players who haven't played, but looking at it, there's only four or five of players who are over 25 and six who we haven't got out on loan. So we, we're organising a fixture, stretching ourselves quite thin for four or five players when the other 15, we're finding clubs for them in decent levels of rugby. Um, so f for us, for instance, I think we're servicing our players well enough for the most part. Um, for, for other teams, potentially, they'd look to play some friendlies just to keep them ticking over or maybe to gain some revenue. You know, the Bar Bars, this New Zealand team as well, they're doing the rounds. I've had a few phone calls about that for exhibition games, so that might be a decent little learner for, for some clubs in the during the Six Nations. You, you said earlier that, that bringing in players on a sort of short-term or injury basis is proving more difficult than you thought it would be. Why is that? Can you, can you expand it a little bit? Well, there's only a certain amount of money you can give them, um, according to dispensation. Um, and who wants to sign, if you've got anything about you, for a, in this climate, on a short-term contract? You know, people want and need security, so I get that as well. So it's, it's therefore, it's a player who would sort of compromise and take a short-term contract? Is he less attractive? Are they less attractive to you? Do you think that they don't have the requisite ambition that you're after? Is that what? No, we're just, it's just salary cap. It's right. purely salary cap that, you know, most clubs, including ourselves, have plotted pretty much every penny and pound out to the 24-25 to the season. Mm. And, and within that, you've got players in your own squad who you're looking to keep on, probably play a bit more as they develop. Uh, you might have earmarked other players for uh, number one slots, so you've set aside that money, so you only have a certain money left in the pot, which only injury dispensation allows for. If you end up spending over that, we all know the consequence for that, me especially. You get relegated. Yeah. It seems to be a bit of a clash at the minute with regards to whether the cap should go back up or down. With, with what you're seeing at the minute, I just wondered if your views... Uh, what are your views on that, and are they sort of ever changing, really? Uh, I said it in the um, the coaches' conference, the prem launch. That was it, the prem launch, and the, there's there's some clubs with bigger budgets who would love the cap to go up and are able to spend that money, um, and in doing so, you know they could compete financially with the contracts that have been offered to some of these lads from French or J the French clubs or the Jap Japanese clubs. It, 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 but if we do that, my own feeling is that we just fall into the, the traps and make the same mistakes of what we've done in the past. Like, oh, it, it is a model that hasn't worked. 
uh, quite clearly. And I know COVID's had its influence on that, but to increase the salary cap at this point in time, you know, ahead of another probably financial, financial recession, speaking to my brother who works in the banking world, was probably to invite, um, increase the, the probability of the, tra the, the, the tragic things that's happened this year with clubs not being able to survive. I can't, you know, I mean, that, that model has proven and proven again not to work. So if you, if, you, if you go into that space where you're looking to increase the salary caps, how can it be feasible? I just, it doesn't, I'm, I am not financially or business minded. Uh, I'm not, mate. But this seems quite obvious to me. <laughs> So, so are, you, are you suggesting then that, well, I suppose the fear, but just to make it explicit, is that your fear would be if the salary cap was raised again to 6.4, that more clubs might fall the way of Worcester or Wasps? They've got to find a way to make to make it work. I mean, I say they, we, because I'm part of this. Um, but my, my job is to, is to put something out there that's attractive, you know, that's a decent brand, um, that's the, almost that that has a a culture and uh, a club ethos that people want to buy into through the rugby through the performance. There's there's bigger, greater minds than myself, like the PGA and the PRL, who under who are renegotiating, as you know, post this World Cup, what the league structure looks like, and what the payment structure looks like through television and the RFU and within all of that whether it's less teams and more games more international games and more games where you have international players playing for your club um, to increase the audiences that's 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 the bigger question that, that's the the bigger challenge should I say because I think as you guys know that what we're putting out on the field at the moment is it's pretty entertaining it's good, it's good rugby and exciting um, but yeah so you're asking you're asking a you can ask my opinion, but it's not worth a lot because I don't have any influence and I probably have less information than you do. Okay. Um, and just two very quick ones from me. Not a week goes by now, or certainly not a fortnight goes by without Simon Orange on Twitter. <laughs> or leading for more fans to, to come to the AJ Bell and watch this fanta fantastic product that you are that you're putting out. <laughs> How many conversations do you have internally about this and what's the sort of... What, what is the solution to, to getting more bums on seats in, at the AJ Bell? I have a, a few with Simon, he's a legend, I have a few. Obviously, there's a want and desire like, to make this feasible, and he's doing everything he can. Like, I'm sure his time is, is worth more than, than, than his Twitter feeds, but you've got to love his enthusiasm, haven't you, and his, and his want and drive to get people down. Um, I, wear, I wear quite a lot of hats. Yeah, more than what I thought I'd have to wear. Um, for me to, to start dipping my toe into increasing fan base, um, I'd really be encroaching on other people's territory. We employ here, plus I've got enough to think, look after and focus on with the performance, you know, and, and, and how that filters down through the local area, um, through the schools and stuff. That, that I can have, that can have a greater influence on than than getting them down. I mean, look, I don't, you know, I'm not shy of the camera or two, and I talk too much. Anything they want to do in terms of raising um, publicity or awareness, I'll do. But other than that, you know, I think I'm a coach first and foremost. I've got to focus on the game. Thanks. So just just finally from me, it's you know. Not quite related to, to to your current job now, but I just wondered if you could quickly pay tribute or a bit of a homage to Alex Good, who at your, your former club, if you if you think he uh, he warrants it, he will break the Saracens' um, appearance record this Saturday. I just wondered what your memories are of working with him. And yeah, oh, um, long and uh, long and myriad my memories of Goody. Like he was a. Uh, I've got to put something down in a video, actually, so you're probably helping me clear my thoughts here to, to, to understand what it is that's so special about him. Like, he, 
Uh, as a young lad, this is one of my first memories I've got of him. He, he wasn't getting in at fly half, and he wanted to play fly half. He had offers from London Irish. And I remembered like taking him for a walk, us going for a walk and talking to him about the opportunity he had at Saracens and how fullback might be something that could open his eyes for space and communication. And so I guess you could say that I was the catalyst for, for all his abuse career. Because <laughs> I don't know a lot about backs play. Agree? You are? Do you agree? What do you agree? No, you can ask him though. Alex Anderson says he's the catalyst for you. Your fullback career, see what he says. He'll probably tell you where to go. Um, but that wasn't one of the uh, earliest. And, and then certainly, obviously, since then, I became a decent friend and we knocked around as a young coach and he was a young lad and had a few beers and slowly you grow older and you, and you estrange yourself and you, and you find different paths and stuff. But I've always, him and his family, he used to come and have picnics when he was playing after England and after the finals with, with my mum and dad in, in, in the uh, in the Twittenham car park. A lot of, like it generally is, memories of people you've spent 10, 12 years with aren't around the training field, aren't after the games. It, it, it's, been, it's been the beer and not just the beer, but the words over the beer and the, and, and the chats at the end of the bar, which you tend to hold on to. A, a bit longer, and, and as well, as well, you know, like he's he's not shy of that either, is he? Like from some of his tweets of Mad Monday celebrations, he is one of the few, right? Then going back to it, in all of that, he's one of the few that's able to get a decent, probably one of the best balances of performance and consistently performing well at a really high level and lifestyle like having fun with it, not taking it too seriously, um, and, and, and striking that balance. And, and, and I think probably because he's been able to strike that balance, he's had longevity in the game. So that and his, the fact he's contact shy, the, he, 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 um, he hasn't burnt out. Uh, he understands what's important about the game. You know, one year, one year sabbatical in Japan, but he's come back to, to the one place which has given him that platform and that's able to let him lead his life as he wants to, wants to lead it. And, and as such, he's, he's been brilliant in, in so many facets. He kind of epitomises uh, new school professionalism with old school um, rugby kind of ethos, isn't it? Like, after the game, go and have a beer. Go and have some fun with your mates. Turn up Monday and crack on. Now I've got a lot of time for him for everything he's about. Cheers, Sally. Any more for any more? Oh, one more. Sorry, I'm going to go there a lot. You have the Argentinians in there. He's in Carrington there for the three days this week. Can you just give me some feedback on what we can see you gleaned from the round? Did you, did you train down any stuff? Did you have a chat with Michael Chef? I don't know what to put down. I miss Michael. I missed Michael. He was in yesterday and I was... I think I was having a cup of tea with Vinnie Cock. Uh, no, I wasn't. I, uh, <laughs> I, um, yeah, we watched the training and there's a lot of similarities in what they do. They've got real high tempo, um, good urgency, good energy in and around what they do, but nothing too dissimilar. Like you can't reinvent the wheel when it comes to uh, prepping lads. Uh, they're very open, quite, quite an open environment. Um, so we had a, a good chat so, uh, with Felipe Contepone and um, Lobe. Juan Lobe was back in the building, who, you know, was one of our one of the legends that played here for for quite a while, so it was it was a it was a good way to start the relationship. And then obviously we had a unit session, with a, a full live scrum more session today against them, of which the lads were a little bit nervy because we've got a game, they don't have a game, they're battling for for spots in this in the next internationals, um, and and their international team, you know, to to, to go against an international team in, in the midweek could be considered potentially uh, risky by way of injuries uh, and, and, how it, and how it has happened in the past because you probably heard some some rumours. Um, anyway, so it was nothing of the sort. There was It was a session conducted with the utmost respect from both sides. You know, there was no like cheering and celebrating if one side 
got a decent outcome from them all or a scrum. There was really good sharing post the session as to what they felt, uh, what we felt. Um, so in, invaluable, really. And, and, and they changed their session, weekly session plan around so they could accommodate us for our set piece today. So I've only, I've only really got positive things to say about the Pumas, um, the coaches and, and how the lads conducted themselves today uh, in, in that live session. Okay, that's a very mature way, turnout, so to speak. I mean, there's been previous instances where like the teams have met up for, for scrum sessions and stuff like that in the, in the middle of the week, and the things have gone a bit awry with one or two people there, <laughs> having a bit, a, bit, a bit of temperament and stuff like that. You, so you did well there, given, given what you said. Happened. Well, that's what I was alluding to, Liam, you know, without actually drawing on the past examples where I'd probably get myself in trouble. Uh, look, the RFU were good as well. They sent a referee down, Adam Leach, from the Isle of Wight. He drove up from the Isle of Wight for his experience and to make sure the session was, was was conducted in the right way. So really grateful for that as well. And yeah, so it, it was a, it was a good experience for us. Okay, just finally on that, do, do, do a team like Argentina really strike you? How they managed to keep it together? Given they, they, their players like will head back this weekend and play play for Premiership, play top fourteen this weekend before reassembling to play the Test match. They, they, they take on a lot of extra stress where you see the say the England team. They're all off in Jersey for the five days this week. Won't play this weekend. Have a nice lead into their game. I mean, it, it shows you the level of commitment that these that, that these guys have to make that little bit extra just to, to, to be to be ready for test rugby and be able to combine it with the club duties. Yeah, I was speaking to Felipe about it, and they're obviously they're only three weeks post the championship, so they've had a little bit of sabbatical, gone back to the clubs, but it hasn't been hard for them to pick up where they left off, where they spent a long time together. Um, they, they've got, looking at them, and they were really tight. Um, really good at ethos, like good feeling, like I say, qu quite open. So they've obviously got a decent culture there, one that's not too hard for them to slip back into, not a lot of teething time for them to assimilate themselves back into um, a team where they're surrounded by, by like-minded people, I guess. That's that's the difference in it, you know. They are all around the world, but when they come together, they they're back with fellow Argentinians. So I guess that's that probably, you know, and I'm assuming here um, makes it all the more easier because you get that kind of sense of home um, when, when you're together as a squad. Okay, Alex, thanks for the insight. I'll let you get back to your cup of tea there, Rafinha.